God bless you for choosing to listen to this anointed message from Dr. Reverend Christopher Abulame of King's Tabernacle, where Jesus Christ is Lord and we are bringing the kingdom to the nations. And, uh, I hope it's not too warm for you. Is it cold enough over here? Uh, not cold? <laughs> we, can, we can decrease the temperature and really, and really freeze you out. <laughs> it's good like this. <laughs> when I see you doing like this, I know you're really cold. <laughs> Glory to God. Well, I think it's comfortable. If it's too cold, just raise up your hand. I know it's too cold and we can turn it up a notch. Praise Jesus. But if you, you need to be out there, it is getting warm. <laughs> Amen. So today is also our communion service and we have our fr friends and family day today. And today we celebrate our friends and our family and all of those who God has privileged us to be part of their lives or they are being part of our lives, whether they be our family and our friends. And, and I thank God for families. And, you know, I, I say to folk, you better, you better appreciate your family. You better appreciate. It doesn't matter how much you love your friends. It doesn't matter how much I love my job. When I'm done after eight hours, I have some people to go back to. <laughs> Glory to God. I have some people to go back to, and that's called family. And sometimes your friends may forsake you, but you have people who still celebrate you, and that's your family. So you, you, we need to appreciate our family. God has given us our families, and, and by his own divine design, he placed us there for a reason. I didn't choose to be born to the family that was, I was born in. But I believe God has a reason for letting me be born into that family. And so I need to trust God that regardless of how it is, sometimes we have different family dynamics and we may not get along with everybody, but God has placed us there for a reason. And so we celebrate that relationship. And same thing with friends. There are friends that God has brought into our lives for a reason. And we celebrate that friendship too. And so that's what we're going to be doing today. And uh, we'll be having service indoors. We'll be having some time outdoors for those who, who love the heat, who have the heat today. And we'll have some food in there. And please, uh, Brother Mike, you're welcome to stop by later uh, and join us during the celebration. And today is also our communion Sunday. We share communion on Sunday, uh, first Sunday of each month. And so this morning, in, in line with what we're doing today, I have chosen Exodus chapter 12, Exodus chapter 12, verse 27, Exodus chapter 12, verse 27, and so the topic of my discussion, brief discussion this morning, is deliverance from Egypt, deliverance from Egypt, and that sounds like a very, a very big title, because we cannot completely exegesis deliverance from Egypt. But we just want to draw some lessons, some lessons from what God commanded Moses and the children of Israel before they left Egypt. And, and why will God tell them to celebrate the Passover prior to leaving? Why will he? They've been there for 430 some years. And now it is time to depart. And God said, I want to institute today some celebration that you must observe all the days of your life. You, your children, and your children's children. And he called it the Passover. It was a command by God. This was not Moses' idea. This was not the idea out of the elders of the children of Israel. This was God's own idea, was a commandment by God. And over the years, Israel has celebrated the Passover. And when Jesus came, Jesus celebrated the Passover. And he committed the same to his disciples. In the book of Acts, they went from home to home, house to house. They shared fellowship together. They were in the apostle's doctrine. And the Bible said they broke bread. There was always that moment where they came together. And you know, when you read the New Testament, 
one of the ways that the disciples would identify Jesus was the Passover celebration, was the breaking of bread. And think about it. Something that happened, Jerusalem had been, been going through this, this moment of confusion because a righteous man had just been crucified. And he said, I will rise on the third day, and he did. And so you have these two disciples who were on the way to Emma, as the Bible says, and they were walking together, both of them, and talking about what had just happened, and they were in a state of shock and confusion. And then some man began to walk alongside with them. And as they got to town, they sat down. And the Bible says the man took bread and broke it. When he did that, their eyes were opened. They said, wow, we did not know that the Lord had been with us all this time. How did they know him? It was a breaking of bread. Now, think about it. When, when Peter, after Jesus had, had reasoned, Peter said to the rest of them, I, I want to make some more money. I think we're broke. We want to make some money. He said, I go fishing. And Peter got in the sea and he began to do what he, he left about three and a half years ago. And then Jesus showed. And when they were together having lunch, and Jesus took the fish and broke it, the manner in which he did it, he said, this is the Lord. That's how they knew him. So it became Christ's identity. And he commanded the church, he said, as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. And that's why the computer is such a powerful moment, and it's a moment of celebration, a moment of thanksgiving. That's why it's called the Eucharist. It started when they were just about leaving Egypt. And now, what am I talking about? Exodus chapter 12, verse 27. It said, that ye shall say, it is the sacrifice of what? Of the lost Passover. It, it, it is the sacrifice of the lost Passover. In other words, it belongs to the Lord. Who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he did what? When he smote the Egyptians. When he smote the Egyptians. When he smote the Egyptians. Underline the word Egyptians there. And delivered our houses. And the people bowed their heads in worship. So Egypt, for us as Pentecostals, has always been synonymous with bondage. But it is more than that. Each time somebody said to you, well, don't go back into Egypt, they say to, they're saying to you, don't go back to the world, or don't go back to bondage. So we have always symbolized, as we teach the word of God, or read the word of God as Christians, we've always symbolized Egypt with bondage, or with the world. But there's something else about Egypt to an average Jewish person who lived during this time. There's something about Egypt. And Egypt in the Bible, in its original Hebrew, is Mitzrayim, which means, go back and check it out, it means a tight place or a narrow strait. It means a tight place or a narrow strait. So whenever an Israelite person or a Jewish person talk about Egypt, what comes to their mind is a narrow strait. So what does that mean to me and to you? It represents us being stuck between two opinions. It represents us being stuck in life in certain things that we did not choose that sometimes have chosen us. It was not their choice to be in Egypt. It was circumstantial. Remember how they got there. We know the story. How there was famine in the land. And, and Jacob had called his children and said, Well, what are you guys doing sitting here looking at me and we're dying? Meanwhile, Joseph had been sold into Egypt by his brothers. 
I think that was one of the greatest sins that I read in the Bible. That his own brothers, I mean his own family members. Uh, we celebrate our family. Like I said, families come with different shapes, color, form, and dynamics that happen. Sometimes we don't all get along with each other. But we're still families. Again, I didn't get to choose where I got born in. I didn't get to choose where I found myself in. Sometimes it's not the people that I was born with that I grew up with. It might be somebody else. But I also believe that God has a way of rearranging my circumstances. And he does that for a reason. Sometimes God takes you from a place to another place. He does it for a reason. Now Jacob, I mean, Jacob had these 12 sons and, and Joseph was the younger, younger of them. And, and his own brethren sold him. Indeed, they were going to kill him. But they said, no, let's not kill him. Let's sell him, make some money out of him. <laughs> Glory to God. And, and there will be some people who want to make money out of you. They'll sell you to make money out of you. They may not literally sell you. They'll use you to make money out of you. And some of them may be your own household. See, I was reading part of the readings that we're doing in the book of Matthew. It said, it said a man's foe, a man's foe, which is a man's enemy, is of his household. That's what Jesus said. Sometimes you find these enemies in your household. And sometimes it's outside of household. What am I saying? And so they sold this young man and made some money, sold him into Egypt. So now his, his family status have changed. He's no longer with his biological family. He's now moved with another family. It was a big change for him. But Joseph made the best of his circumstance. His circumstance changed. He made the best of it. Not only that, he found himself in part of his house, and from there he landed in jail. Now he's in prison. His father, his mother, back home. I don't know how much thought he gave to his mother and his father and his brothers who sold him out. But now he is in Egypt and learning Egyptian culture and language. From the prison, he found himself in the palace. And now Joseph is settled in as the governor of Egypt. And here comes his brothers. After the father said, what are you doing here? Yeah, we're dying. Go get food. And that's how they found themselves now moving into Egypt. But what Joseph did was so remarkable. When he revealed himself to his brothers, he wept and wept and wept. And when his brother apologized to him, he said, you don't need to apologize. He said, the Lord has sent me ahead of time to preserve life. Now, who would have thought that Joseph, Joseph will be the one preserving the life of the entire tribe of Israel? This man was sold out, adopted by another family, raised by them. Schooled by them. Not much investment was done by his own biological family. But when they came to him, the Bible said the man said, don't worry. He said, God. And that's what I'm saying. God orders that step. I, I'm here today. I know God. God brought me here for a reason. I grew up in Africa. Grew up way, way back in Africa. 8,000 miles away from here. How did I get here? How am I here? Will I ever return to Africa? I don't know. But do I make the best of the opportunity that this country has given? Of course I do. And that's how this man landed there in Egypt. And who would have thought that God would use him to preserve the life of an entire nation? Would it have been right for him to be hurting and feeling so bad and bitter? Yes! He had every right and reason to feel bad when he saw his own brothers 
buy his own food. He had, he had the power to put them in jail. He had the power to kill them all. He had the power to revenge against them. But Joseph, no, 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 the man wouldn't do that. The man knew the Lord enough that in spite of all that I've gone through, family is still family. In spite of all that I've gone through, there's a purpose for it. That you didn't know what you did. Had you known what you were doing, you would not have done it. That's what they say. Had you known that I would be sitting here today presiding over the entire first civilization, you would not have done it because you didn't like my dream in the first place. You didn't know what you were doing when you sold me out. But I walk with God enough to understand my journey. And there's a reason for God letting me be here. This is how Joseph understood it. And he forgave them all. And not only that he forgave them, he brought them in. Not only he brought them in, he settled them in the choices of land. And that's how Israel established themselves in a strange place and began to grow as a nation. But on the day that they will leave, God instituted the Passover. And so to, to them, Egypt means being stuck. To us is bondage, to us is the world. But to an average Israel, Israeli person, a Jewish person who understands the Bible and the true meaning of Egypt, it means being stuck. Where are you stuck today? Are you stuck in your mind and all the things and the experiences that you've gone through? You see, I, I have learned over the years to build new memories. I remember some things, but a lot of things I've done. Because I choose to delete those things out of my, out of my files. Things that don't add value to my life, I don't remember them. I meet folk who've offended me way back and I hug them and they apologize. I don't even know what they're talking about. Because that had been deleted out of my memory files. Don't carry those things because it's not worth it. It's too, it's too much of a burden to bear. It's not worth it. I build new memories every day. If you don't, you'll be stuck in the past. Some of us cannot move because we're stuck in the past. The mud of the past have jammed your wheels. Can't move. You ought to think about what happened. What, how can I change what happened yesterday? Can't. But I can, I can sure make choices that defines what happens tomorrow. So I'll be more concerned about how my tomorrow is going to look like than wasting my tomorrow today by thinking of tomorrow or the past. Stuck in one place. Some of us are stuck in relationships. That's not adding value to your life, but you are still nursing that relationship. Yeah, it's all right to try to make it work, but at some point in time, you got to let go. It's not the will of God for your life. You're stuck in it. You cannot move when you're stuck in it. Some of us are stuck in certain businesses or certain places where we're not, we're not supposed to be there. And now look at, look at Lot. Take Lot for instance. Lot had followed with Abraham, ladies and gentlemen. He would never had made the life that he made were not for the relationship that it started off with Abraham. Ladies and gentlemen, pray, and we're talking about friends and family day. We cannot, we, you don't choose what friends, I mean what family you're born. I didn't choose that, but I still bear the name. But I can sure choose the friends that I hang out with. I can sure. I can do that. Can't change my brothers. And, and, you know, just say, well, those are my brothers that we, you saw on photo. Those are not my brother no more, guys. You're my brothers now. I mean, biological brother. We cannot do that. You just cannot say, well, you know that my brother in Togo? Yeah, not my brother no more, pastor. You're my brother now. We can be brothers in Christ, but we just cannot switch our brothers. But I can switch my friends. I can, yeah can switch my friends. The reason that is vital is that you, you have to, con that we draw connections every day. 
every day we draw connections. And that connections is supposed to bring us ultimately to our destinies. Now, when, when, you're, when we're born to families, right? We're all born into a family. Most of us, if not everybody, at some point in time, you leave home. And you leave mama, you leave father, you leave your family, brothers and sisters. Some of us, our brothers and sisters, are way far from where we live. But as we navigate this world, what happens is that we're sending out our signals and feeling the world and feeling everybody. And there are some connections you make along the line. And those connections are valuable connections that help you move to the next level. And some point, you disconnect from that connection and now you're connected to another. And that kind of moves you to the next level. And all of these connections are mostly done by choice. But as a Christian, the element of prayer and allowing the leading of the Holy Spirit comes into it. Just, 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 don't, just don't do stuff because it looks good. Not everything that looks good is God. Some things may look good, but God may not be in it. So when Abraham, what I'm saying, Abraham leaving, leaving the land of war, and Lot said, I, I saw something about uncle. I, something about uncle is, it is yeah, I'll go with him. It's my father, it was Abraham's father, Nehor, that said, come on, let's go, let's go. All of us three, let's go. And after Nehor died and Abraham and Lot were together, Abraham wouldn't leave Lot. He took Lot with him. But the association between Lot and Abraham yielded so much fruit for Lot. But Lot made a very, very life costly, life changing mistake. When, when they began to grow and their businesses began to grow, and Abraham, being the elder one, said to Lot, Lot, I, I heard that I, I, I heard men are fighting. Can we just make a deal here? You, know, you look at the land. This is Abraham's wisdom. He's the older man. He could have said, Lot, I want you to go over there. I want you to go over there, settle over there. He, he had the power to do that. No, he gave him choice, and that's what God does. God gives you and me the choice. Say, look at the land. See how beautiful it is? You make your choice. I'll back you up. If you ask me to lead you, I will lead you. But I want you to take the lead. Tell me what you want. See, my mother always tell me, he said, whatever you ask from God, that's what God gives you. He said, go ask him. Whatever you ask. You ask not and you'll receive not. Whatever you ask of him, he'll give you. That's what my mother, my mother always reminds me of that. As old as I am. Like I don't already know. <laughs> Glory to God. Now, Lot, Lot made a very, very bad choice. Because he was not led by God. When Abraham said, look at the land. He said, okay, I'll take that. Not everything that glitters is gold. Sometimes your mind is telling you something. You know, for some of, folks who, who hop from one place to the other, listen, let the Lord lead you. Who jump from relationship to relationship, friendship to friendship. Oh, I saw that person down the street and I just like his shirt and I go with him. Oh, I saw the other one down the street. I just like his beard. I go with him. You, we, it, it, no, you got to be led by the Spirit of God because you're Christian. That connection that you make helps you to get to another level in your life. It's not just there for nothing. There's a reason why God will bring you that way. There's a reason why God let me know all of you sitting here today. And I need to cherish that reason and make sure the ultimate plan of God is fulfilled. Just can't walk away from you. You see, when somebody, when somebody is easily willing to walk away from you, he was never connected with you in the first place. Don't cry over it. Don't weep over it. You know, sometimes God, God wants to take the weed out. <laughs> he approves it, boom, takes it out of your life. Go over there. And, and I'm here, Lord, I love that weed, and I'll go get it, i bring it back. Boom, plant in my life, and God said, okay, I'll let, you, I'll let you do what you want. And after two years, you come back, God said, is that thing working out for you? 
<laughs> Glory to God. Is he working out for you? You just walked away from the will of God for your life. And God tried to help you, you're right back at it. Let God lead you. And then Abraham, Abraham said, Lord, look at it. Take whatever you want. And Lot, Lot, Lot took, Lot looked at it, and he saw Sodom. So why are shining lights over there? And then he went over there. He got stuck in that place. And the Bible says as he stayed and settled in, Sodom began to encroach into him. And before he knew it, he was surrounded by Sodom. And go ready. The Bible says that Lot was a righteous man. And he was vexed. His soul every day was vexed by what was going on in Sodom. But he couldn't leave. Why? Because he stopped. That was his Egypt. That was Lot's Egypt. He was stuck in Sodom. Couldn't leave. He was stuck right there. And, and, and one thing I, I feel bad about Lot is that Everything that he had and all that he brought in. You see, the, the reason that they had that fight in the first place was because he had so much stuff. God has blessed him so much. Had a lot of cattle, had a lot of oxen, all of these things. And he brought all of them to Sodom, all his servants to Sodom. When he left Sodom, how many of them left? How many of them, those servants, were still with him? None. None. It took the angel of God to grab him. The, the, God read the Bible. They said the, the angel of God had to cast him out of the town. He had to be forcefully removed because he stopped. His mind tells him, get out, but his body couldn't move. He was stuck in it. It took the angel of God, took him out by force. And when he left, it was him and his daughters. That was it. His wife was gone. His business was gone. Everything he owned was gone because he made a choice. To move into a place that God didn't want him to be. But by his own choice, he was there. But he got stuck. So when, when Israel talk about Egypt, what comes to their mind is a person who is stuck in an experience. Who is stuck in a place. Who is stuck in a relationship. His soul is vexing. Don't like it, but can't leave. Don't like it, but can't leave. Don't like it, but can't leave. Because he's stuck right there. Think about your own life as I reflect on mine too. What are the things that I'm stuck with? What are the habits that I'm stuck with? What is it that my heart is telling me? Leave. But my, my body, my spirit just cannot do it because I am stuck. But God can deliver. And that's why I titled the message that they delivered from Egypt. It would probably be delivered from being stuck. <laughs> Glory to God. Delivered from being stuck. Just bow your heads and talk to God. Ultimately, he delivers. Deliverance comes from God, ultimately. He's our deliverer. Tell him, Lord, I, I look at my life and I think that I am stuck. Daddy, please, Lord. Unstalk me. Deliver me from anything and any area of my life that I am stuck. Would I be in my mind? Would I be in a place? Would I be in a relationship? Would I be in a situation? Whatever it is, God is faithful. Tell him, Lord, I, I, I need to leave. It may not happen right, right, right at this moment, but God sure is doing something about it. When you have the heart and you have the faith, God has a will. And that's why the man said, if thou, if thou will, let me be healed. Jesus said, I will. God has the will. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. God has the will to do what we want him to do in our life if we let him. Father, we thank you this morning. Lord, we give you all the glory. Lord, we give you all the honor. Father, we pray for each of ourselves. In wherever we're stuck in. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you will help us to be unstuck in the name of Jesus. Wherever we have jammed ourselves in, that God we no longer can move. 
Father, I pray that you would just help us to move out of that location, out of that situation, and bring us, God, to the place that you want us to be. And Father, we give you the glory, we give you the honor. The Passover invites us to take stock of where we are stuck and to seek help that we need to get unstuck. So as we approach today, our Passover time and the communion table, tell the Lord, Lord, let this be my help to get in stock from where I have been stuck in the name of Jesus. Let it bring me help, O oh God, to get unstuck from where I have been stuck in the name of Jesus. If you have been blessed by this message or have a prayer request, we would like to hear about it. Please call us at 401-954-6188 or visit our website at www.kingstabernacle.org. You are also welcome to join us on Sundays for services beginning at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 6 p.m and for Wednesday Bible studies at 7 p.m. We are located at 500 Greenville Avenue in Johnston, Rhode Island. Please remember that you are always welcome at King's Tabernacle where Jesus Christ is Lord and we are bringing the kingdom to the nation.